what is driving you? Well, I think ever since I've been small, I've always enjoyed stories. My dad, when I grew up, my dad always had some stories around, some books. And I grew up reading these novels, and he was always like opening this new world and entering into this new world and living there. So around primary four, I tried to make my own story. I started writing. So I began writing small, small stories, but never anything this big. But then when I was in SS3, I saw some news about kidnapping. My parents were talking about it. A girl had been kidnapped. This happened somewhere in Enugu. And it just disturbed me so much. And for days, it was on my mind. And I just knew I wanted to write about this. That was because of the way it kept persisting in my head. Something about it was so disturbing, so upsetting, that I needed a medium to just express everything. And so I began thinking of this book. And this was just a manifestation of that disturbance I felt. You called it Whirlwind of Metamorphosis. Yes. Why? Well, um, in a biological sense, the word metamorphosis refers to change, where, for example, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And so it just refers to change. But in, the, in this uh, context of the novel, it refers to change of situation, change of circumstances. And what you have in this uh, book is a family that starts out very happy on top of the world. The father, the head of the house, has been elected to a new and very powerful public political position. The mom, she's happy. The kids, they're happy. And they get news about the kidnapping, and it just upsets the world. So it's supposed to refer to the kind of change, the kind of drastic, intense change this family goes through as they begin to experience kidnapping, cultism, and all these vices that affect youth today. Well, um, when I read um, the little information behind the book about you, I understand you're reading computer engineering. Yes, that's correct. At the Massachusetts uh, Institute, of Technology. Institute of Technology, MIT. Yes, that's correct. In the United States. And then you're writing a novel. You're supposed to be, <laughs> you, are, you are supposed to be coming out with inventions. Yeah. You know, <laughs> some new software. Yeah. Why? How? I mean, why are you um, coming into arts? Yeah. Or how are you combining arts and engineering? I think it's a very interesting kind of split of mind that has been with me ever since secondary school. Because in secondary school, I was more of a mathematics student. I did math a lot in my free time. I would solve math problems for fun. To me, ma mathematics was very fun. But at the same time, it, I didn't just want to be one person. And because I wanted to write, I said, OK, just because I do math doesn't mean that writing won't be part of my life. And so I said, I'll just branch out. And so I've been trying to develop these two spheres separately, mathematics and writing. And in a way, they kind of complement each, each other very beautifully in my life. So I feel like just because you do one thing doesn't mean that you can't branch out so completely and do something else. It's kind of my need to diversify my interests. Tell us a little about yourself. You know, um, you, you grew up, you were born somewhere in the east? Yeah, I was born in Enugu. Yeah, and then um, tell us a little about what you've been doing since then. Um, so I was born in Enugu. Um, I went to Divine Love Primary School, which was there. And that was when I, I had my first contact with mathematics through the Nigerian Turkish International College Primary School Mathematics Competition. I was pri in Primary 5 then. And through this contest, I got admission into the secondary school with 75% scholarship. And there was a condition that for me to keep my scholarship, I had to get 85% at the end of every year. That's my average. And so there was the motivation to keep on studying hard. And so over the six years I was in the secondary school, I just kept going, trying to reach this 85% borderline. That's at the Turkish uh, college. College, OK. Yes. And every year, I always made above 85%, which was an A. So every year, I had reason to study hard. And every year, I was, I was always able to make it. And it just encouraged me more to try, try out other things. I enjoyed math, so I tried mathematics competitions. I did the cowbell mathematics competition. I was first in Abuja, and I was fourth in Nigeria. Um, I did the American, mathematics, American math contest, which is a worldwide contest. And I was ranked in the top 1%. Um, 1%? Top of, uh, the best 1% yeah, that worldwide. participated worldwide. Yeah. Okay. And after secondary school, I applied to several universities, including MIT and Princeton University, two very prestigious universities. And eventually, I chose to attend MIT to study electrical engineering and computer science because I've always been into computers. So how has it been, you know, <laughs> being a fresher? <laughs> In, uh, the univers in a university that is so far away from where you were born, where you grew up? At first, it, it was very nerve-wracking. I went there. I mean, in Nigeria, I'm used to eating Nigerian meals. Then I, I go to the US, and I have to change my diet. So the food is different. The weather is so cold. The academics are so hard, and everything moves so fast. So it was challenging. I was homesick. I was just a mess. 
But you know, with time, you just begin to adjust. And I began to figure out the patterns, and I began to fit in. And I was able to finish my first year at MIT with all A's, which was not easy, but it's something I'm proud of. Oh, great. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Let's talk about um, a whirlwind of metamorphosis. Yeah. I've, I've, I've read the book yeah. to a point. I have not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I was captivated, and that was why I actually wanted you to come on the program and talk about it. Right. I don't know if there is part of this book you'd like to share with us. Oh, I think my one of my favorite parts is actually towards the end of the book. Okay, just just for a minute, let's right. let's hear you take us into this world of yours. All right. <laughs> <laughs> a few nights later, Ashley was staring out a window, looking at the dark sky. She had a lot to think about, and it was easy to imagine the condensed weight of her thoughts shooting across the heavens, expanding until every cloud bore a small part of her mind. She watched the moon and realized it never had to worry about friends, enemies, love, and hatred. It never had to sit back and wonder if it would get through the day without falling apart. Its world was structured, peaceful, unlike the world of humans, a world continuously altered, battered, and shifted by life. Okay, um, you know, when I, I tried to read this book, I saw turmoil, you yeah. know. I saw this family, ideal family, yeah. tearing apart. Well, towards the end, there were some remediations yeah. in, in their situation and all that. Yeah, things began picking up a bit. Yeah, so um, is that your experience while you lived here with us? Um, it's, not my, it's kind of my experience just in terms of a general sense, but not yeah. directly. I mean, no one, I've never known anyone who was personally kidnapped. <laughs> and I, I don't know any cultists. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, I read the news and I have a feeling that this kind of thing is happening in Nigeria. But what this book can say about every family is that each of us go through two miles. I mean, Nigeria is still in a state of trying to grow. And because of Nigeria's problems, families all across the country have been affected by these problems. And so what I was trying to do with this book was trying to show that Nigeria's problems have a direct impact on society, that our flaws affect people, affect families. And towards the end of the book, when things start looking up a bit, I'm trying to say that I believe that Nigeria can get better. I kind of just believe in a world where families begin to overcome their problems little by little. And it just ties into my sense of belief that ultimately we can overcome our problems. Okay. Um, you're a young man and you're growing. And you've made these modest achievements in your short life. What will you tell children your age and those that are younger than you are? I would tell them to look at the world around them. And they shouldn't just be passive passerbys. They shouldn't just be sitting down and watch the world pass them. They should realize that these things have an impact on them and on their families. And they should think of a way that they can imp impact it be it by telling the story, trying to expose what the world is like, be it by getting actively involved in some way. But the most important thing is just trying to be educated because it's through education that you have the frontier for development. So by stepping into their shoes, they're expected to feel the shoes of education and enlightenment. They can put themselves in a position where they are actually able to do something to the world. Okay, we'll take a short break. And when we return, would look at the future of this young man who has this book a 537 pages isn't it? 547 yeah. page book which is called whirlwind of metamorphosis talks about kidnapping cultism and family tribulations in nigeria don't go away and television was invented it was not only to entertain but to tell stories of heroes on the pains of the weak to reveal the big secrets and report the little things that matter. To unveil the complex issues and bring reports of events and personalities that shape our lives. Open your mind to true television with Frontline. Hot, incisive, in-depth, straight to the point. Frontline, wherever the news is. Chaos and conflicts. We see community action for good governance. They see poverty and want. 
We see perseverance and the will to go on. They see economic law. We see the ingenuity and creative spirit of our people. We are AIT News. Fresh, authentic views of Africa. How would you rather see the world? AIT News. All sides, all the time. When people say democracy should be interpreted differently according to culture or geography or whatever, I take it with a pinch of salt. He was so militarized. His whole body was military. There was nothing democratic about uh, OBJ. This party chairman, a few months ago, um, got up and told the whole country that Boko Haram were freedom fighters. Now, in any other country in the world, which was facing an Islamist insurgency where people are being slaughtered, and the chairman of the ruling party will get up and say that, that those insurgents are freedom fighters. This will be a reason to ask the gentleman to resign. Hello and welcome to Frontline, your Sunday show. I am Obiora Ilo. Is your Frontline and my guest is still Vincent Anioke, a young man that has distinguished himself in so many ways. Vincent, where are you going from here? You are at MIT, no doubt. Yeah. Are we going to see more books or more software discoveries or... What are we going to see in the future? I think in the future you'll see a little of both. Um, I am currently working on the second book, which tackles a more fundamental issue of poverty in Nigeria. And I've been working on it for the past five weeks, and I'm developing it. So hopefully in the future there'll be a second book out that, that talks about this. And for the other side, I have begun my entry into like very strong software classes at MIT. So I think it's not very far off in the future that you see me hopefully working for some software company, or even trying to make some new software. I mean, there are so many possibilities right now with computer engineering, the world runs on computers, and I'm very excited to see what the that world holds for me. Okay, before I let you go, what role did your parents play in this? Did they write a book for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what role did they play? You know, my parents, they've always been um, very encouraging people in my life. I mean, the reason I write so much was because they provided all these books around me for me to love writing and reading. And the reason I even began writing this was because they'd always encouraged my artistic endeavors. So my parents had always kind of trusted me, trusted my abilities. They've always encouraged me. Whenever I needed something to read, to write, they were always there to bring it for me. So my parents have always kind of just been there to push me up. I mean, I even halfway through this book, I kind of stopped because I felt tired and it seemed too long. But my mom read it. She said she loved it. And she encouraged me to go on and finish it. So they've always pushed me. So they've been like a backbone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Vincent, I'd like to thank you for coming on our program. Thank you very much. I wish you all the luck. Thank you so much. The book is Well Wind of Metamorphosis by Vincent Anioki. It talks about kidnapping, cultism, family tribulations in Nigeria. I think every family should get a copy of this. We'll take another break. When we return, we'll be joined by the ambassador of Israel to Nigeria. Stay tuned. Television was invented. It was not only to entertain, but to tell stories of heroes on the pains of the weak. To reveal the big secrets and report the little things that matter. To unveil the complex issues and bring reports of events and personalities that shape our lives. Open your mind to true television with Frontline. Hot, incisive, in-depth, straight to the point. Frontline, wherever the news is. They see chaos and conflicts. We see community action for good governance. They see poverty and want. We see perseverance and the will to go on. They see economic law. We see the ingenuity and creative spirit of our people. We are AIT News, fresh, authentic views of Africa. How would you rather see the world? AIT News, all sides, all the time. When people say democracy should be interpreted differently according to culture or geography or whatever, I take it with a pinch of salt. He was so militarized. His whole body was military. There was nothing democratic about uh, OBJ. This party chairman, a few months ago, um, got up and told the whole country that Boko Haram were freedom fighters. Now, 
in any other country in the world which was facing an Islamist insurgency where people are being slaughtered and the chairman of the ruling party will get up and say that that those insurgents are freedom fighters. This would be a reason to ask the gentleman to resign. Hello and welcome to Frontline, your Sunday show. I am Obiora Ilobi. You're watching Frontline on AIT. And joining me now is Uriel Palte, Ambassador of Israel in Nigeria. Ambassador Palte, you're welcome to Frontline. Good to be here, Mr. Obiora. How long have you been in Nigeria? I've been here now for over 15 months and I'm enjoying every minute. Tell me more about Nigeria that you have seen in the, the last 15 months. Mr. Obiora, Nigeria is a great country. I fell in love uh, with your country, Mr. Obiora. You have a great country. You know, it's, it's not an easy country, but it's a country full of challenge. It's a fascinating country. It's an interesting country. It's a country where every morning whenever I wake up, I'm asking myself, may I have some more hours in the day so I will have more time to do more and more things that I will enjoy your great country. Fascinating country, challenging country, interesting country. How would you describe the relationship between Nigeria and Israel over these years? It couldn't be better. A few months ago, I, was, I had the privilege that no Israeli ambassador was privileged to have this privilege prior to me. Not because of me, because of your great president, His Excellency Dr. Goodluck Jonathan. He came to Israel and we had a great successful visit. President Jonathan made a pilgrimage and he had an official visit to the State of Israel. He met with uh, His Excellency President Shimon Peres. He met with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Moshe Yalon. This successful visit really uplifted the relation between Israel and Nigeria. You know, he traveled Israel. He uh, really he flagged off 35,000 pilgrims from Nigeria to Israel. There is no any other country in the world, thanks to my very good friend John Kennedy Opara, who had this effort of bringing pilgrims to Israel. And this year, this year hopefully, there will be 40,000 pilgrims from Nigeria to Israel. And the president, who really flagged off this pilgrims. You know, there was a mess uh, of 3,000 pilgrims from Nigeria to Israel in the Jerusalem Convention Center. Four hours of mess. And then there were the services and singing, the national anthem in Nigeria and the national anthem of Israel. Tell me, what can be more excitement for Israeli ambassador to Nigeria and vice versa, the, my very good friend, the Nigerian ambassador to Israel, His Excellency David Obasa, then seeing the Nigerian president, to, uh, Nigerian president and Israeli president celebrating together the alignment between Nigeria and Israel. Okay, you've been here and um, your country has been a country constantly, you know, facing challenges of terrorism, challenges of uh, relating with neighbors and all that. And today, Nigeria, unfortunately, is facing a very big terrorism challenge. Mr. Obiora, you are absolutely right. Unfortunately, we see today both countries fighting this terrible phenomena of international terrorism. You right now, you are right now living this terrible crisis of the kidnapping of over 200 Chibok girls. Right now in Israel, three young students, Gilad Shahar, Naftali Frankel, and Eyal Yifrach, were kidnapped uh, more than 10 days ago by the Hamas terrorist movement. We are all praying to the bring back our boys, bring back our oh girls. God. You know, this is a mutual prayer for the safety, for the security 
of your girls, our boys. The world should face the terrible phenomena of international terrorism. It's all sponsored by Iran. Whether it's Shabab in Kenya, whether it's Hakim in Morocco, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, whether it's ISIS in Syria, whether it's Boko Haram in Nigeria, whether it's Hamas in Le Israel. We should, and this is a mutual challenge that Nigeria is facing it, Israel is facing it, the international community is facing it. You know, I've heard someone say that terrorism has become a global brand. It has, become, <laughs> it has become an international commodity. No, Mr. Obiora, uh, do I uh, uh, pronounce it correctly? Very well. God bless you. You know, there was a famous professor some 15 years ago. We all know Francis Pokoyama. He wrote a famous book, The End of History. I'm sure you here in Nigeria, we in Israel, I uh, served in different places. We all prayed, we thought, you know, I thought I'll be fired. Diplomats will, have, will n not have anything to do. Because he, read, he wrote The End of History. There won't be any more international relations. All diplomats will go home. And since then, it was in the mid-90s, early 90s, see what happened. 9-11, the Twin Towers collapsed, the war in Iran, the war in Iraq, uh, the uh, international terrorism, all over the world, Bosnia, uh, you name it, uh, here in uh, Nigeria, uh, Mali, uh, wherever you go, you see war, you see terrorism. I wish there would have been end of history. No end, and yes, there is history. So the world should stop international terrorism. We should do in your region, in our region, all over the world, anything we can do to stop conflicts, to try to reconciliate and to negotiate peace, and first and foremost, to stop terrorism, Mr. Obiora. Okay, let me go specifically to the unfortunate incident in Israel 10 days ago, uh, the abduction of these uh, teenagers. What facts does Israel have that Hamas carried out this kidnapping? Well, um, as uh, some of you know, we have uh, excellent uh, intelligence. And uh, our intelligence found uh, proof that Hamas did it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority established a national unity government with the Hamas uh, terrorist organization. Uh, and we would love to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority uh, a final uh, agreement to, to have peace with the Palestinian. Uh, we would love to see what uh, is being called in the diplomatic jargon the two-state solution, that finally Israeli and the Palestinian will live one by one, what we is called, this, as I said, the two-state solution, one Jewish state, one Palestinian state. And what they've just done, they signed an agreement to have uh, the Palestinian Authority living with the Hamas, uh, having a national unity government. And Hamas is a terrorist organization, and we have a proof that Hamas kidnapped our boys. And we, in the next few days, we will show the world the proof. You don't have it right now? Oh, you have it. You, do, you don't want to show it right now. I, I cannot show it. Uh, I promise you that I will show you the proof. You know, in, in the aftermath of that kidnapping, Our instance, intelligence, which is a well-known, mm -hmm. uh, have the proof, and uh, that's why we are right now around, he around Hebron in the West Bank. Like um, yesterday, we heard that um, a, a teenager, um, a Palestinian teenager, lost his life. In unfortunately. Unfortunately. And you've had these uh, accusations of high-handedness from uh, Palestinians against Israel, especially when things like this happen, that Israel takes laws into its hands and um, um, cuts down on the human rights of the Palestinians and all that. You know, Mr. Is, it, is, it, is it something that, that uh, you agree with? You know, Mr. Bioram, Let's think about Borno State. Mm -hmm. Let's think about Madiguri. Um, let's think that you want to find the Chibok girls. Wouldn't you do anything that you can to look for the Chibok girls? We are looking for our boys. And we are doing everything we can 
to find our boys. But you can do we that within, within the ambit of, of the law. Uh, we are doing it. I mean, we're within the it. ambit of international good behavior. We're doing it within the ambit of the law. I taught public international law in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I began my career within the legal department. Uh, I was a trainee of the, uh, of the legal advisor of the foreign ministry. Believe me, we are trying everything we can within the limitation of the public international law, everything that we can. Unfortunately, you know, when you are looking into your boys that you know that Hamas kidnapped it, kidnapped them, we are trying to find them. We know they are at the hands of Hamas. And not all the Palestinians are letting us to look for them. I'm uh, crying on the loss of every Palestinian boy as we are crying about the loss of every Jewish boy. Unfortunately, that's not Hamas uh, are doing. Hamas are, killi are, are calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. Hamas are calling to kidnap our boys. That's why we think that the national unity government between Hamas and the Palestinians cannot exist because this is a government of people who are calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. They are calling to kidnap our boys. I wish they would have called for the signing of peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians. So I wish we will find our kidnapped boys. I wish the Chibok girls will be found as soon as possible. You know that Prime Minister Netanyahu, I was involved in it, Prime Minister Netanyahu called His Excellency Dr. Uh, Goodluck Jonathan and condem condemned the kidnapping of the Chibok girls. You know that he offered uh, President uh, Jonathan help of Israel um, and not only that he offered that uh, we were part of what is called uh, quote unquote the friends of Nigeria and hopefully all kidnapped girls in Nigeria, boys in Israel will be found alive and will be returned back home safely to their families. Okay, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you know that the kidnap of yeah. the teenagers is just a, fall, a fallout of this ongoing tension, ongoing unfriendliness that has existed between uh, the Palestinians and Israelis. What are the fundamental challenges that ma that's making it impossible for these two peoples to sit down, like you said, and have some agreements and work out terms of living together. What are the problems? Because some people say that ba the Bible says it will never, there will never be a resolution. But in modern times, we've seen very hard situations also uh, get to a resolution. What do you think are the problems that's making it impossible for these agreements to be reached? Thank you, Mr. Obiora, for asking this uh, fundamental question because you really you touch the hard core of the Arab-Israeli conflict. You know, Israel was established in 1948, and we can divide the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict to two major parts uh, of the history of the state of Israel or the history of the conflict. There were first part of five consecutive wars between Israel and the Arab states, and then President Sadat of Egypt came after the Yom Kippur War when Egypt was defeated and he realized that there was no way to negotiate with Israel by war but to negotiate peace with Israel. And in 1979 we signed the first ever peace treaty between Israel and any Arab country. And now since 79 it's already, what is it, 35 years that we have peace between Israel and the largest Arab country. Egypt was the leader of the Arab world. And now we have peace treaty in the west of Israel, in the south of Israel, southwest of Israel. Then, following President Sadat of Egypt, the late King Hussein of Israel signed peace treaty uh, with Israel, Mr. Obiora. I was privileged to be the coordinator of the peace with uh, Jordan uh, on behalf of the late Prime Minister uh, Rabin of Israel. And now we have peace with uh, Egypt in the south and west. We have peace with Jordan in the eastern part of Israel. This is the longest border that Israel has with any 
Arab country. So you see, there is hope in the Middle East. We have peace with Egypt, we have peace with Jordan, and I hope one day we will have peace with Syria, we will have peace with Lebanon, and we will have peace with the Palestinians. That exactly what Secretary Kerry, try John Kerry of the United States, tried to achieve in the last 10 months. The major issue with the Palestinian is to negotiate the future of the two people. The two people, whether it will be in the West Bank, whether it will be in the Gaza Strip, let's negotiate. That's what we are telling the Palestinian. It's not terror, it's negotiation. Okay. Um, in 2003, during yeah. the Intifada, yeah. I had the opportunity of being in Israel. Ah, great. How was it? Uh, well, it was good. <laughs> it, wa it was revealing. Yeah. It was uh, educative. Yeah. And you discover that when we talk about Palestinians yeah. and we talk about Israelis, you're yeah. talking about people that live together, yeah. that share so many things in common. Yes. And as an international um, political student, I have also wondered why it is to, so difficult. What are those things that are holding back Israel? Israel has talked about peace with security. You see? The, your, your Palestinian brothers are talking about security with peace. They've talked about some liberties that are going back to the old uh, borders and all that. I remember vividly the efforts of uh, Bill Clinton when he was living as president to bring, I think, I, I think um, the present prime minister was prime minister at that time. What, you know, I mean, you've been in it. You've yeah. Tell me about it. What is holding these two peoples back? What is holding them back from finding peace? You know, it's... Um, because it's like a revolving door, you, every day there's peace, you go out through the door, you come back to the same door and all that. One of the crucial issues that both sides are talking about, part of it, the same piece of land that uh, we have to find a creative solution. You know, when you have a, a real conflict on the same piece of land, you have to be creative. You have to find a creative solution. And I think one day, and I be truly believe, we will find a creative solution. We were on our way to find a creative solution. By the way, uh, President Clinton in Camp David in the year 2000, yes. when he convened, uh, then it was Prime Minister Barak, and it was uh, uh, King Hussein, and it was Arafat. Uh, they all came to Camp David to find a creative solution. Unfortunately, Arafat wa didn't have the goodwill to sign. This was one of the creative solutions. Can be other creative solutions. Um, Prime Minister Olmert was on his way to to find a creative solutions. Prime Minister Netanyahu had some creative ideas. Uh, it's not a lack of ideas, it's a lack of goodwill. But uh, both sides uh, need to realize that they have to live together. And um, I truly believe that we will live together. Uh, I believe that we realize that uh, we can live together in the two-state solution. It will not be easy. But, you know, I think that countries that hated each other much more Think about, it was not so long ago, France and Germany. You know, they fought each other in, the, it's not this century, it was in the 20th century. Two horrible wars. See today the relations between uh, France and Germany. You know, this was only First World War and, you know, today we, I wouldn't say celebrate, but we mark the centenary of the First World War. It was 1914, the beginning. 1914 and today is 2014. It's exactly now that we are marking the, you know, my late grandfather fought in First World War. It's, uh, it's people that we, we knew, at least uh, I knew my late grandfather. He was officer in First World War in the German army. You know, uh, uh, Jews fought in both armies mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that fought in First World War. So, and then they're living together now in the European Union. And I can tell you about another war. I'm sure you have wars in Africa that uh, here in the civil war, uh, two sides live together. So I believe that the conflict between us and the Palestinians, you know, we're negotiating. Prime Minister Netanyahu and Abu Mazen met uh, not long ago. You know, the distance between Jerusalem and Ramallah 
a 10 minutes ride. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes ride. You know, it's like from Masoko to Maitama, the, the distance. Maybe it's more than 10 minutes ride. It's 15 minutes ride between Asoko and Maitama. Between Jerusalem and Ramallah, it's 10 minutes ride. Sometimes, depends where do you drive. Mm -hmm. Depends on the traffic. So you don't need to go to New York to negotiate. So I believe that the conflict, I told you, it's a matter of uh, land, it's a matter then of water, uh, but it's all issues that modern world can solve today. Okay, we'll take a break, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And when we return, we talk about how the world should collaborate to fight this international commodity that is called terrorism. Don't go away. When television was invented, it was not only to entertain, but to tell stories of heroes on the pains of the weak. To reveal the big secrets and report the little things that matter. To unveil the complex issues and bring reports of events and personalities that shape our lives. Open your mind to true television with Frontline. Hot, incisive, in-depth, straight to the point. Frontline, wherever the news is. They see chaos and conflicts. We see community action for good governance. They see poverty and want. We see perseverance and the will to go on. They see economic law. We see the ingenuity and creative spirit of our people. We are AIT News. Fresh, authentic views of Africa. How would you rather see the world? AIT News. All sides, all the time. When people say democracy should be interpreted differently according to culture or geography or whatever, I take it with a pinch of salt. He was so militarized. His whole body was military. There was nothing democratic about uh, OBJ. This party chairman, a few months ago, um, got up and told the whole country that Boko Haram were freedom fighters. Now, in any other country in the world, which was facing an Islamist insurgency where people are being slaughtered. And the chairman of the ruling party will get up and say that, that those insurgents are freedom fighters. This would be a reason to ask the gentleman to resign. Hello and welcome to Frontline, your Sunday show. I am Obiora Ilo. Well, if you're just joining us, you're watching Frontline on AIT. And my guest is Uriel Palti, the ambassador of Israel to Nigeria. Well, Israel is a country, small country, but there's so much Nigeria can learn from Israel. Let's talk about what your country has done in agriculture. What would be your advice to Nigeria? Well, I don't think Nigeria needs advice from Israel. Uh, thank you for mentioning uh, agriculture. Uh, you have a great uh, agriculture minister, uh, my very good friend, Dr. Adeshina. Uh, he can teach, I think, uh, all over the world uh, about agriculture and uh, economic agriculture. Uh, just recently, he hosted here our agriculture minister, uh, Yair Shamir. Uh, by the way, he's the son of our former prime minister, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, which, uh, whom I had the privilege of working for him. And Yair Shamir came here uh, really uh, wearing two hats. He was a guest of the president of the centenary celebrations, mm -hmm. and he was a guest of Dr. Adeshina. For example, when our uh, uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture came here, he met with uh, Dr. Adeshina, he met with uh, Sarah Reng or, or Chekpe, the Minister of Water Resources, he met with the uh, ECOWAS people, I'm ambassador to ECOWAS as well. There are so many things that Israeli agriculture has to share with Nigeria, with ECOWAS, uh, with business people in the agriculture field. Uh, Minister Adeshina made a great reception to our, uh, by the way, I don't know if you know that Adeshina is a great dancer. I don't know if I'm allowed <laughs> to know, say. I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay, so, <laughs> I, uh, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> but he even invited my wife to a great dance. But uh, there's so many things in agricultural field that uh, we can share. Whether yeah, whether it's fish, mm. fishery. Mm -hmm. There are today uh, fish uh, 
how do you call it, fish pools uh, in, uh, in Bayelsa. I just visited uh, Governor Dixon. Mm -hmm. By the way, he gave me a new name, Oyintari, God's love. I'm in Asian now, uh, <laughs> two weeks ago. But there are uh, pool, uh, fish, uh, how do you call it, fishery pools uh, mm -hmm. that Israeli, uh, Israeli companies are involved in, uh, in Bayelsa, in Edo State. Uh, Comrade uh, Oshimuli, the governor, Comrade Oshimuli, uh, just told me when I visited, I visited the Edo State. So he told me about Israeli companies that are involved in... Okay. Uh, f f f so okay. there are many, many areas no, of Israeli agriculture that they share uh, their experience with uh, Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay, let's go back to the problem of the moment. When you were, when you started, you accused Iran of sponsoring terrorism organizations across the world. And I will ask again, what evidence does Israel have? You know, the evidence are all over the world. Go to Kenya, go to the bombing in Kenya, that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is being sponsored by Iran. Go to Akim in Morocco, go to Hezbollah in Lebanon, go to see what's going on right now in Syria in Iraq, go to Argentina, the bombing of the Israeli embassy in Argentina in 92, or the Jewish community in 94. You just said to listen to Ahmadinejad, uh, I don't think they're hiding it. They are proud of it. Uh, go to all the funneling, uh, or the channeling of the money from Iran to the terrorist organization. Uh, they, they were proud of uh, being uh, behind the terrorist attacks. Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, the Al-Qaeda arms, uh, they sent it, unfortunately, all over the world. Uh, that uh, It has been found that uh, the money, the training, the be sending it uh, via diplomatic pouches, uh, that um, it's uh, all over uh, terrorist. Uh, uh, hopefully, the international community, that's what we hope, will enforce them to stop it, but this hasn't been done. Okay, um, you talked about the visit of President Goodluck Jonathan to Israel and the offer of your Prime Minister to assist Nigeria in fighting terrorism. In which specific areas would Israel be interested in assisting Nigeria in this fight against terrorism that is fast growing in our country? You know, uh, I'm sure that Nigeria know how to do it and to fight terrorism, and it's not only Israel. It is what is called the Friends of Nigeria. It uh, was uh, the United States, it was uh, Great Britain, it was France, it is, it's not was, the United States, Great Britain, France, uh, Canada, uh, some other countries. There was a summit in uh, Paris, there was a summit in London last week, and uh, hopefully Nigeria will uh, gather uh, and will continue to fight international terrorism. Uh, but as I told you, Prime Minister Netanyahu condemned uh, the Boko Haram and uh, will do whatever we can uh, be of help. And back to the three kids that were kidnapped. Uh, does your intelligence still say they're alive and well? I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. But are there uh, back channels to see whether no. some kind of agreement will be reached? Not that I know. Not that I know. I don't know about any back channel. So what's your final message think, uh, on that? That uh, our forces are right now continue to search from house to house, from uh, water well to water well, from street to street, continue to look for them. And we all pray for their uh, being well and alive and for as I said please God and uh, all our soldiers here and all your soldiers and forces in a uh, in some busy forest and in Borno state and wherever bring your Chibo girls uh, alive back home as soon as possible and bring our three boys back home alive as soon as possible mr. ambassador on this very optimistic note i'd like to thank you thank you Mr. for Obama. coming on frontline i hope we'll see you again 
Definitely. And that's our program for today. I am Obiora Ilo from Abuja, Nigeria. Thanks for joining us, and let's do it again, same time next week. <laughs>